thank you for coming in today. Um, uh, before we begin and introduce, uh, before we begin, we just wanted to go ahead and introduce our support team um, as they're the ones who made this all happen. So, uh, yeah. Hi, Kyle. So excited to see you. Thank you so much. Um, I am really grateful when these conversations are happening that you're going to lend um, all the work that you've been doing and your perspective to them on these really important topics. And uh, yeah, I've been working with them. They're doing a great job. I, I guess for the recording, we'll say I'm with the Sierra Club Oahu Group. I'm an organizer, program manager, and I've known you for years and been a fan. <laughs> Aloha Kyle, my name is Ben Trevino. I uh, have had the great fortune to work with these youth on uh, this and the, the prior aspects of this program in my capacity as the Heart uh, Sustainability Planner. I am part of our program for community-based learning called the Heart Sustainable Mobility Lab. Hi Kyle, um, I'm David Miyashiro. I'm the Executive Director of Hawaii Kids Can, which is a relatively newer local nonprofit focused on education advocacy and policy. In particular, we do a lot of work around uh, youth civic engagement and empowerment. So it's been a real pleasure to work with both Lauren and Ben um, and to see these youth in action. They're awesome. You're gonna be totally impressed. Thank you so much to our adults for supporting us and uh, allowing this to happen. Um, they will now be going uh, off to the side for now as we'll go ahead with this uh, youth-led uh, interview. Um, uh, now we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves. So my name is Jonah. I am will be a second year at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and I currently reside in Aia, Hawaii. Hi Kyle, um, my name's Anna. Uh, I'm also at UH Manoa. I just finished my second year, and uh, I was born and raised in Malaysia, but I now live on Oahu. Awesome. Hello, thank you so much for being here. I'm Karen Abe. I um, went to UH Manoa for the past two years and from the third year I'll be going to USC. Um, I have born and raised here so a lot of these issues I'm so passionate about. Awesome. Oh sorry and then um, moving on um, to give like you know more context about like what we do, um, what we are as a group. We are the youth advocacy like pu public policy program part of the program. Um, which is a series of youth-led initiatives to engage in public policy development with social justice and equity at core. Um, main purpose is for youth to grow their leadership skills, build relationships with like-minded activists around the island, um, and work collaboratively on community-centered policy action. Uh, so part of the program, we had um, these like community change forums, which were like virtual like discussions we had, um, which were like district based. So we could really highlight different social justice issues that came up in different districts. And a lot of this was just so we can have our youth participate in voting, um, get involved, you know, in all these public policy issues. Awesome. Yeah, and for our audience, uh, we just wanted to kind of um, attempt to like give a brief overview of Kyle, um, but Kyle would love to for you to chime in after this. Um, so Kyle is a um, activist and a community organizer from Hawaii, and he's currently a board member of Hawaii Peace and Justice, but he's done a lot of work in education and action for the demilitarization of Hawaii. Um, and the just a general U.S. military occupation of Hawaiian lands is extremely educated in and have taken part in many actions over the years. Um, but Kyle, feel free to uh, kind of jump in and kind of give like a overview and what you do and what you're passionate about. Right. So should I jump in now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, you know, thank you, uh, Lauren, and, and all of you for uh, inviting me to come and um, share with you folks. I was really excited when I uh, got the email. Um, so just uh, to add on to your uh, introduction, um, I'm I'm currently also a, um, a recent PhD graduate uh, from UH Manoa in the Department of Geography. Uh, and I've done lecturing at UH and I, I, I will continue to do that in both uh, geography uh, as well as ethnic studies. Um, and so, um, and currently I'm also involved in uh, some organizing that grows out of Hawaii Peace and Justice. Uh, but we have a coalition, an international coalition, uh, trying to address the uh, RIMPAC military exercises that 
are scheduled in Hawaii every two years. And this year is especially concerning because of COVID-19 and the, the high rates of um, infection within the military and the thought of bringing you know, 25 to 30 countries to Hawaii in the middle of a pandemic just seemed like a really, really bad thing. So we've been working with international allies to try to address that. Yeah, so thank you so much for uh, kind of explaining your work. So I guess we can go uh, get started with our interview. Um, so I guess our first question and kind of like the overarching idea of our um, our initiative is to talk kind of talk about social justice issues. Um, so I guess with your perspective and with you, your line of work, I guess how would you explain like what social justice is and how does it relate to your work? Okay. Um, so, I mean, social justice, I think um, often we define it in terms of the negative, like, you know, ending oppression or ending racism or something like that. And I, I think it's important that we move our vision uh, and our imagination into the positive. So the presence, uh, and this is what Dr. Martin Luther King talked about, uh, peace is not just the absence of violence, but it's also the presence of the conditions for life to be full, right? Uh, the basic needs are met. Uh, culture and education is um, can be practiced uh, freely and, and in fulfilling ways uh, that uh, people have um, the right to self-determine uh, and and so in the context of Hawaii I think what's really fundamental is to recognize that the history of uh, the US takeover of Hawaii an independent country uh, is foundational to almost everything else that we're, we're facing right and so um, Self-determination is one of these internationally uh, recognized human rights. After the World War II ended, the United Nations uh, said that you know colonialism was one of the root causes of the war, and so to, to end that, they called for decolonization through the process of self-determination. And all these countries in the world became um, independent in this sort of wave. Um, Hawaii didn't, <laughs> and and there's complicated reasons why. But I think that that's one of the lingering. Um, um, problems or contradictions about Hawaii's case is that uh, self-determination was not really afforded. And so what you're seeing with, you know, a lot of the Hawaiian movements and, and it's also happening in places like Guam and, and Puerto Rico and other places in the world where um, the promise of, of self-determination was never fully uh, uh, fulfilled. Uh, some other things we have in Hawaii uh, related to social justice is, a, is economic justice, right? The right to have um, a living wage, the right to have a home that, that you can actually afford, um, you know, having access to healthcare and education. Healthcare, especially right now, we, we're seeing all the holes in our system uh, and the lack of access to healthcare. Um, it just, uh, you know, unfathomable unfathom that in a developed, highly developed country like the United States, uh, people don't have access to basic needs like healthcare. And then environmental justice and climate justice is like one of the overarching existential issues around the planet. <clears throat> and it's, it's partly the unsustainable way that the capitalist system continues to devour materials in the earth and produces all this waste, which is now you know, threatening our survival, our, our ability to survive on this planet. And we really need to change course in a serious way. So those are some of my thoughts. <clears throat> No, yeah, th those are great. I think, thank you for kind of honing in also on um, your work in Hawaii, because I think um, a lot of what we're trying to do is also to focus on um, how issues are, are perceived here through the lens of people who grew up here um, and Native Hawaiians. Um, so in that lens, um, how does, what does anti-fascist, anti-racist activism look like to you here in Hawaii? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, I think Hawaiian organizing, I think the labor movement, uh, I think the environmental movement for the most part has uh, all had elements of anti-racism um, and um, anti-fascism in the sense of, of confronting, you know, sort of the sort of extreme white nationalism that I think drove part of U.S. imperial um, policies over the years, um, but it pops up from time to time in different ways, right? So the anti-Japanese movement in the 1920s, the internment of Japanese, uh, persons of Japanese ancestry during World War II, uh, the Massey incident, 
um, you know, so there's, there's sort of these um, episode, episodes that resurface the systemic problem of, of racism uh, linked to colonialism um, and the, the sort of um, system of violence that holds that in place, whether it's uh, the police uh, or the military um, or the, just the, just the kind of cruel um, economic systems that grind us into submission, right? Where you have to accept terms that are not um, uh, humane in order to just survive, right? Um, by depriving you of the means to actually live, uh, that's how you create workers out of um, indigenous peoples that were happy with the environment and the culture that they had. Uh, now you have to become workers because you don't have access to the resources, right? And so there's ways that deprivation and that kind of violence squeezes us out of the ability to live free lives and sustaining lives. Um, I think uh, there's more, more specific kinds of ashes. Um, you know, going back to, well, when you look at what, what happened in the 50s when um, uh, anti-communism was uh, at its peak. Uh, there were a lot of groups that were um, the labor unions, uh, the Communist Party was very active in shaping the labor movement uh, and the Democratic Party, right, uh, were red baited, right? They were criminalized and a lot of the leaders were driven out. Um, so, you know, in a way you could say that people were fighting against this stuff way back then, but we didn't have the kind of awareness that we're seeing right now with the Black Lives Matter and the way that people are connecting across different issues and across different com communities. Uh, the inter intersectionality that's happening is really exciting and the kind of global um, scope um, that's enabled by technology is pretty amazing right now. Um, and so I, I think we, we're seeing uh, a resurgence that's, um, you know, and it's opening up possibilities that we haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, no, thank you for uh, talking about that, especially like, you know, the history of within Hawaii as well as like, you know, the systematic issues that we, we continue to face. And I guess in terms of talking about those like systematic issues as well as like, you know, you talk about economic as well as how it like, how it's all part of like the system of oppression, I guess like in terms of our position and our youth, like what are, what are certain things that, you know, youth could get involved in to, I guess like, help fight for those, fight against those systematic issues? Um, well, there's, there's lots, <laughs> there's all of it, right? Um, the, no revolution or social movement has, has been successful without a strong youth-led component, right? So I think youth movements are the kind of the energy that um, uh, gives uh, social movements that momentum uh, and the force to, to make change happen. And we're seeing that with the right now with the Black Lives Matter um, reforms and changes that people have been demanding for decades, all of a sudden are happening overnight. Monuments to colonialism and racism are coming, are falling down. Um, you know, uh, police departments are being uh, radically restructured, um, and so um, sometimes it, it takes a disruptive um, action. Um, to break with the existing system. I mean, so part of how power stays in, in power uh, is by embedding us all within its, its force field, right? And keeping us, uh, giving us enough so that we're not willing to risk change. Uh, and, and apparently uh, things are so bad that folks are like, hey, I, I've had enough. And it, sometimes it takes that spark. And, um, it's always really interesting. Um, a lot of people are studying this stuff. It's like, what is it that's, that is the right ingredient? And what is the catalyst that brings the spark? And I don't think we've always, you know, I don't think there's a, a, a perfect answer to that. It's sort of like this entire assemblage of things need to be kind of moving and changing. And it's always, it always is moving and changing, right? But uh, at the right moment, that spark will, will set off something and it will transform the whole system. So it's, it becomes an event, a historic event that transforms things. But if you didn't do all that um, kind of painstaking and unglamorous work to build connections, to, to transform consciousness and um, understanding, uh, to 
present an, an alternative vision so that people's imaginations can stretch. If you didn't do all of that work ahead of time, you, you don't have the, the assemblage of, of elements in place that can then transform when the, the catalyst comes down. So I think, um, gosh, I got way off on your question, <laughs> but I think, you know, in terms of, in terms of youth, um, so you folks have, you know, are, are part of that, that spark that, that carries this new energy. Like I, I can't move as fast and uh, do as much anymore, you know, but I was watching this march that happened for um, the Black Lives Matter march, the big one, you know, and uh, also the Hawaiian marches uh, for uh, uh, mobilizations for Mauna Kea. Uh, this, there's something really exciting happening uh, and new uh, futures are emerging from these ruptures. So if, if you take the Hawaiian metaphor of, of um, what one metaphor is the kipuka is, is like when uh, there's an opening into a different kind of reality, right? So whether it's um, um, when the lava flows and it kind of wipes out all the um, forest, but it's a little island of, of forest that becomes the source of new life to regenerate. Uh, and so we have in a way like a lava flow of destruction and exploitation and oppression that has kind of um, left a devastated landscape around us, you know, and around the planet. But there are these islands of, of creative, of um, progressive and diverse thinking and practice. And those are the kind of places that are, are going to create the new seed bank to repopulate uh, the future, right? So that's the kind of place where emergence can happen. Um, so I, th I think we're at that kind of a moment. The other, the other concept from Hawaiian thinking is hulihia, is a time of a up overturning. Like when, a, when Pele erupts, uh, that's a hulihia moment. It's the earth is, is from its bottom, it's coming up and it's, it's, over, um, it's overturning the reality, the social reality, the environmental reality. Um, and then it is creating these new conditions for something to grow again. And so I think that's the kind of moment we're in right now globally in Hawaii, in the United States. And so you folks are, are those part of those new seeds, right, that are, that are creating uh, the vision of the future that's emerging right now as we speak. And different futures could emerge. So which ones we choose and how we, we support those to grow are really crucial. No, yeah, I thank you for um, contextualizing and for, for those metaphors, I think. Um, and also for bringing up the the Black Lives Matter march because you know that goes back to the whole youth organizing thing. It it was completely organized, or um, at least mainly organized by youth. So that was just um, kind of an amazing expression of of activism and compassion um, from the the youth on in Hawaii. Um, and kind of in line with that, um, you know, for me personally, when I when I first moved here, a lot of the the organizing work that was being done that I was able to observe was through like labor union work. But I would love to hear um, on in your in the work that you've done, how has community organizing played a role in the the mobilizations around the, the demilitarization of Hawaii? Mm, okay. Um, so I think there's community organizing has been key and it's also uh, different and um, uh, it, it doesn't follow the same models or formulas that I was familiar with from the continent. So I got trained in sort of um, uh, Alinsky style community labor organizing, um, very pragmatic, uh, you know, sort of power analysis, a very systematic way of doing it. Uh, and I found that in Hawaii, um, so much uh, work is happening in a, at a informal or unstructured level, like through family relations, through personal relations, uh, those tendrils are all connecting underground. You don't often see it, but uh, when conditions are ripe, things emerge from the ground, like a mushroom that pops up when the conditions are just right. And so I, I, I realized, okay, you know, you can't impose a certain form, although system, having systematic process and having those kinds of organizational infrastructure help, and matter uh, at key times, like with the emergence of the Proteko Olave Ohana, uh, if not for the existence of, so, of institutions like uh, legal aid, uh, like the Model Cities program, all these war and poverty uh, programs that were funded by the government, um, intended to suppress urban dissent, 
or, or pacify urban dissent. So in the way it had a logic of counterinsurgency operating uh, why they created these programs. At the same time, it gave resources to grassroots organizers who then used those positions to organize people or they already had a network of people that they were in touch with that they could then move into the Kaho'olawe movement when that came about. So the PKO itself, the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana, was a relatively lean organization, right? It, it remained somewhat informal. It's based on uh, like a model of a family, like an extended family, Ohana. Uh, but it also had the backing of these other institutions that they could draw on resources, the connections and expertise and so forth. And so there's a kind of a hybrid way that things uh, seem to have happened here. And I think the labor unions, if you look at labor history in Hawaii, often it's those organic uh, connections of family, of community ties that was drawn upon in order to support the, the strikes and the kind of labor actions that were going on, right? So I think both happen in tandem um, and that's important, um, at least in, in, in this context. And I, I think if you luckily enough in many countries where organizing is most successful and most full, uh, it, it involves the whole community, right? It involves your whole life, a social life of that community, you know, to be really successful. So uh, yeah, I don't think it can be just purely about uh, a pragmatic calculus of uh, cost and benefits or um, you know, picking the best uh, target, the best issue and the best strategy. Um, it also has to involve how do you transform the people of a community in a way, in their social life itself, right, in its fullness. So yeah, um, I definitely agree with like, you know, being organic and I think Hawaii is in a unique position and does do things in a unique way when it comes to like organizing. Um, but in terms of organizing, I do want to connect it back to some of your work. And I know you've done a lot of work, uh, work within like the, or understanding research within like the demilitarization of Hawaii. So I wanted to see like your, get your perspective on that. And like, I guess like in terms of how has like Hawaiian movement to community movement really affected uh, the demilitarization of Hawaii? Um, well, so um, I guess the, the important or pivotal um, event and movement was the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana, which emerged in uh, the 1970s, right? 1976 was the first group that landed on the island. But when you really look at that, uh, when I studied that, that movement and that particular moment in time, uh, it was almost accidental how certain things came together. So this is, again, back to the earlier point about how social movements are catalyzed. Uh, other things were already in motion. Other relationships and connections were happening. Things were in motion in other communities where this particular spark, this particular um, event of nine people going on the island in protest uh, suddenly transformed everything um, in a fundamental way. It, 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 it became a place where uh, a Hawaiian cultural and political awareness uh, crystallized. Uh, a lot of the grievances and kind of uh, um, just the, the feelings of anger and, and frustration uh, was suddenly became hopeful and positive and creative through that disruption, right? So nine people defied the Navy, defied the Coast Guard, landed on the island. They were just going to check it out, but all of a sudden they were changed by that encounter as well. So the land itself, I think one of the big revelations for PKO was that um, it's not just human agency. Uh, Aina, the land also has agency. The things in our world also uh, have some role in changing uh, who we are and how we feel, right? And this is a knowledge or wisdom of indigenous uh, cultures and indigenous ontologies uh, all over the world is that um, you, you relate to place or to the, to the land as an entity, not as a thing. And so that opening that happened between the activists transformed them, transformed the way they talked about the place, the concept of aloha aina, and the fact that the island itself was genealogically related to them. All of these revelations began to come together through that act, right? And, and it, it changed the way that the, the um, um, environment was was understood as a as a issue or a, a topic for organizing it changed the way that hawaiian cultural concerns were um, addressed in organizing and so 
Uh, that was successful in stopping the bombing of Kahoolawe in 1990 using a, a range of different a combination of tactics. Uh, but it also sparked the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, the Hawaiian cultural um, a renaissance was, was um, in, energized by that movement. Uh, other places uh, took, uh, were, were inspired by it. So ma the struggle for Makua Valley uh, began around the same time. Uh, other communities that are still dealing with military impacts, Waimanalo, Waihole Waikane, Pohakuloa, Nohili on Kauai, uh, Lihue on central Oahu Wahewa. All of these places are dealing with these legacies and current um, violence against the land. And, uh, and that was you know, sparked in part by, uh, by Kaho'olawe. And since then, you know, we, and so I come into the story through sort of my involvement with Makua Valley in the late 1990s. Uh, but I've worked with a lot of these different uh, communities and trying to bring them together and exchange uh, information, relationship, build relationships, um, share and, and support each other, you know, um, in terms of strategy. It's, I think we've been able to um, at least raise a, a more critical awareness of the problem. One of the things about uh, the military in Hawaii is we, we're one of the most militarized sites in, in the planet. Um, the military has huge impacts on the land and the environment, right? Thousands of contaminated sites throughout the island. But as um, Phyllis Turnbull and Kathy Ferguson say, uh, they're two professors at UH, uh, they said everywhere you look in Hawaii, you see the military but it's hidden in plain sight, right? So it's become so pervasive that it's one of those things that you just sort of overlook in your daily life, right? From the road you're driving on, to the water you're drinking, to the airspace and sea space that, that's controlled by military power. Um, all of these things are, are around us, but we, we don't think of them critically. So part of our work has been to try to raise that critical awareness. Um, sorry. <laughs> the phone rang. Uh, it, it's to kind of make it visible, and once you, you know, once you then see it and recognize uh, that something's wrong here, that there's a contradiction in the middle of our community here. Uh, now we can have a conversation about what we can do about it, uh, and and then begin to imagine into the future what are some of those you know alternatives that we we never had the ability to see before because we were just you know we had blinders on. Yeah. You know? So I think that's been part of our work. And if you, um, uh, at least now there's a more of a conversation. It's still tough because the military economy is so kind of controlling, just like tourism is. And in many ways it functions almost like a drug, like an addiction, the way uh, politicians and businesses and even labor unions uh, are addicted to that, that kind of economy where we're willing to sacrifice other things or other people or the land in order to maintain that flow of money, right? So that to me is behavior that looks like addiction because it, it comes at a high cost to the, the body of our community, of our land and so forth. And so um, like any addiction, it's hard to wean yourself, but you need to do it. You need to have a process and a plan and do it gradually over time so that you don't cause a shock to the system, right? Um, so I think that's kind of where we're at. We're at a point where uh, the pandemic has revealed one of the uh, biggest contradictions was, was that the tourist economy is actually very risky and brings a lot of danger and precarity to our islands. Um, but we're also seeing that the military does the same thing, right? The fact that we can't stop uh, the RIMPAC exercises, we don't get information from the military about how many cases they have, right? They stopped reporting uh, base uh, location specific uh, data on uh, military uh, infections in, with that, the COVID-19. Uh, the RIMPAC exercises are going on despite uh, so much concern in the community. So it just raises all these problems about, okay, we, we see that there's these contradictions. And the other kind of thing that's um, looming, one of the things we were very concerned about is Red Hill. Uh, under Red Hill, there are 20 giant fuel tanks that have been leaking over the Halava Aquifer. Uh, which is the main um, source of drinking water for Honolulu, right? Supplies 25% of Honolulu's drinking water. Um, so the potential for catastrophic failure um, means that we, you know, um, that people, um, 
you know, we, we, we've been demanding that the, the Navy either close the tanks or double line them, right? Do a massive retrofitting. Um, and they've been ref refusing to do that. We have no power to compel them, even though the um, Port of Water is adamant about it. So it, it reveals these contradictions of like, okay, who, whose interests are being served by these systems? And maybe we need to start uh, developing alternatives right now so that we don't uh, put ourselves at risk in the future. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. I, I really appreciate that um, you kind of gave us like almost like a timeline as well. Um, because my own involvement in what is um, in, in the movement here has a lot of been about like changing my own consciousness. And so I appreciate that you brought up the fact that, you know, a lot of, um, for example, like the military's involvement is, is almost subtle, but not really. And so it's a lot about like changing your critical awareness and how you um, perceive life here and in the effects of the military and tourism, especially on Native Hawaiian communities. Um, so kind of in line with that, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but what are some of the alternatives to militarization and tourism that you've envisioned and that you've heard in conversations in Hawaii? Yeah, so um, I think we, we may need to also um, challenge some of our assumptions about what an economy does, uh, the, the kind of the capitalist framing of our economic understanding uh, is based on this idea of continued growth. Um, and, and so, and that's not sustainable, right? The kind of endless extraction of the planet is why we have a climate change crisis and all of this. And so I, th I think we have to think of degrowth as possible so we are a very important um, part of our repertoire of what we need to look at, right? Uh, continually developing is, is not necessarily uh, the way we build ourselves out of this, right? Um, in terms of alternatives, um, I think Hawaii has a role to play um, in terms of, of environmental restoration. If we could become an innovator and a leader in um, uh, techniques of uh, aloha aina, malama aina, uh, that, that link up to the global concerns around the climate, but also deal with local sustainability questions, right? Um, what if, if that was something we really cared about, how come our budget doesn't reflect that, right? The budget, whether it's for the local state or U US budget, right? I think environment gets about 2% or something, healthcare, education, all about the same military gets like 60, 70% of the, of the budget. So it's like, okay, something's wrong with that because the budget is a moral document, right? It expresses our, our priorities in society. If some of that was shifted, wouldn't that make us more secure? So I, I think that investing in that, if we could really create jobs uh, in environmental restoration, in education, our teachers are leaving because they can't afford it. Why aren't we paying our teachers what they're worth? If we value our children, if we value their education, teachers should be getting paid uh, at a level that's commensurate with that, right? Um, so these are all forms of service that um, should be valorized. Um, you know, and, and if, if you think of how military service is always valorized uh, in this kind of weird um, way that um, uh, you know, also people always say, thank you for your service and all of this. And, and it seems almost perf um Pro forma, it's, it's I, I, I think it's more for show that people say those things, but if but people do join these um, the military a lot of times for this uh, idea of I, I want to serve my community, I want to serve my country. Uh, service could be um, yeah, like let's let's deal with this environmental crisis we have, let's educate our children, let's build resiliency into our our food and um, economic systems, right. Um, the, the pandemic has revealed our vulnerability to shipping disruptions and so forth. So we have land. How come we're not producing more food that is accessible, that's healthy, right? So I think Hawaii could be a, a leader in, in some of these things. Uh, I think tourism, the kind of tourism that just caters to anybody, um, uh, if, as they're, if they're willing to pay or that makes Hawaii's land and development uh, a resource for others to invest in, uh, that's that's hurting the local people, right? It's, out, it's 
making it impossible for people to live here because of the cost of living. So if we prioritize like what economy should be for, which is as a tool for enabling life to happen, uh, then maybe we would protect certain things, create rent controls, right? Restrict foreign outside investment, speculative investment in real estate, uh, deal with and really, really limit um, the kind of, uh, um, what do you call it, those illegal vacation, short-term vacation rentals. Uh, so people are buying up housing stock and turning it into illegal rentals. And, and we're seeing how that jeopardizes us when the pandemic uh, uh, quarantine violators come over and then try to evade you know, the quarantine and stuff like that. So there's all these things that are like, okay, these things don't work for us. The pandemic is revealing that. Uh, and I think we can you know, start now by, by uh, uh, addressing uh, other priority, by reprioritizing our economy. And there's several um, proposals out there, the Aina Aloha Initiative, the feminist COVID recovery plan that are starting to speak to some of these uh, priorities. So we need to impress upon uh, the decision makers to not default back to the old normal, which brought us to this crisis in the first place. Um, just thinking bigger is um, reorienting our relationships around the, the, the region, both with other Pacific islands, but also with other countries. Right? The fact that Hawaii had been subsumed into the United States means that we get kind of cut off from international relations in, in a way that um, limits our opportunities to develop. Um, and you know, if we want to think of uh, a future that's not so militarized, our, our region is just this giant zone of exception. Right? It was one of the regions that was never fully decolonized after World War II. So you have the Compact of Free Association over the Micronesian states, where they're not fully independent. You have Commonwealth of Northern Marianas, you have Guam, um, and then you have Hawaii. And so we're all at different stages of being in a kind of a colonial relationship to the United States. How come we don't have a better way for us to collaborate regionally? And isn't that um, something of value to the global community, right? To have a Pacific that is neutral and peaceful, where economic commerce can happen, but it's not under the hegemony of any imperial state, whether it's China, Russia, you know, US, Japan, whoever, right? But that maintaining that neutrality should be of some value that I think could help. Um, like if there was an escrow account at the international level um, that countries contributed to to maintain this region as such, uh, could that become a way that we have a, a new kind of internationalism or regionalism that um, was bigger than just each nation state as a separate thing, but that we work as a region to try to develop um, in a more sustainable way. We have more in common with our other Pacific Island neighbors in terms of the environmental risks, the security risks, and the economic um, needs. Uh, and so if we could collaborate better um, in a way that supersedes or transcends the old nation state model of international relations, maybe we have some other um, opportunities, right? would have the biggest EEZ in the world if, if all the Pacific countries were together in some way, right? So there's, there's some opportunities I think we're not fully um, explore, exploring because we have maintained these colonial relations of dependency and subordination. I think that's a really good um, like out view, like perspective on, um, on like talking about like what could like the Pacific region and what it could represent. And I, I strongly felt like what you were saying about it. But a, uh, a question I have in mind kind of going on, on with that with in terms of like peace and security within like the Pacific region as well as in Hawaii is like, how do we like, you know, change that mindset of like what people's perspectives are on the, on the purposes of military? Like a lot of people say the military is here to protect us. They're in our best interest interest and we can't survive without them so like do you is i guess in in a sense like do you see like us change like the military becoming can be changed or representing something else or how do you how do we go ahead and change that mindset of what what is the purpose of a military yeah well i mean if you look at history i mean in terms of that how do we change the perception of the military and if we just study history we see that the present military system that we have um, is really about conquest. It's about invasion and taking other people's resources, right? So 
it's driven by an imperial kind of geopolitics uh, and like why Hawaii was overthrown, why it was annexed, all of that uh, goes back to an, a kind of an imperial way of approaching uh, the world and, and relations with other countries and other states. So um, if we're talking about maintaining peace, if we're talking about maintaining security, um, I would look to some of the feminist theorists who are redefining security, right? Militarized security has only brought uh, dispossession, um, violence against local communities, environmental destruction. Um, you know, it's, it's brought all kinds of insecurity and harm to local communities where these military bases are hosted, right? And when we talk to folks in the Philippines, uh, Okinawa, Guam, Korea, uh, Australia, I mean, all over the world, Marshall Islands, right? We see people getting kicked off their land. We see land getting taken away and contaminated. And so militarization has not brought security. But if we flip the idea of security, if security means having um, the means to have a life, clean environment, economic opportunities that are sustainable, um, health care, education, uh, all of these things are not brought by a militarized system that we have, right? Because the budget has been assumed by military uh, we aren't able to invest in these other needs that communities have. So I think by flipping that um, understanding of uh, or what we prioritize, again, going back to budgeting, uh, you know, we, we, we can see, okay, yeah, let's defund this stuff, which is causing more harm and suffering and like start funding things that we actually need. Um, maybe you don't need all those guns to protect ourselves because there's enough human security. There's enough, um, you know, sort of security at the, at the, um, community level that people aren't going out and trying to invade other people, right? Um, diplomacy, <laughs> diplomacy is like one of the instruments of, of, of dealing with uh, international conflict. Um, and we don't practice that anymore. By having a, an overdeveloped military, I think the, um, the temptation is to use military force instead of diplomacy. So it's kind of like by having the capacity to use your gun, you're gonna pull the gun out first uh, before you talk to people. And, and we, we're seeing that with the, with the um, police and the way they deal with um, so-called crime, right? Uh, we, and I think we see that in US foreign policy is to always uh, pull out the gun first, uh, threaten to shoot somebody if they don't do what we say, right? Um, the nuclear gun is the biggest gun in the world. So we're gonna point that at your head and say, if you don't do what we say, right? So it's created a really distorted idea of what and uh, being an international part of the international community means, right? It's created a pathological relationship with other uh, peoples in other countries around the world. So maybe demilitarizing everyone, disarming, setting limits, denuclearizing, uh, takes away some of the threat and we can actually look at, okay, well, what do people really need? What do we want? You know, our common survival on this planet requires dealing with the climate. Like how come we're not cooperating on that? Uh, survival on this planet means dealing with pandemics uh, like this current one. How come we don't cooperate on that, right? Because we're locked into a geopolitical mindset about competition between states. So, you know, people have always talked, to, they always say, oh, Hawaii can be the Geneva of the Pacific, right? A neutral meeting ground. You can't be that if you're also the headquarters of the biggest uh, military empire in the world, right? You can't be those two things. So if we create a neutral space in the Pacific, maybe we could really fulfill some of that vision of being the place where people come together to meet and talk, right? And if the Pacific was a neutral zone where it didn't come under anybody's hegemony, right? And we weren't beholden to the geopolitics of these kind of great powers trying to manipulate us, uh, maybe we could have a, a different kind of relationship with the world. Maybe the Pacific then could be a leader and like, like uh, Pacific states have been on the climate, right? In some ways, our vulnerability to these global forces make us more attentive to dealing with them in responsible ways. I think this is something that island peoples have always had. It's like you have a fragile ecosystem. How do you live in a sustainable way within those means? That's a, that's a lesson for the world to learn in the time of climate crisis, right? So can Pacific peoples actually be leaders because of the wisdom developed through millennia living on in these kind of spaces, right? 
where you have protocols. You go to somebody's house, you don't just come in and make any client. You, 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 you ask, uh, hi, I'm, I'm coming here. This is who I am. This is why I'm here. And they have elaborate protocols when, um, between different Pacific peoples, right? It's a way of maintaining peace and understanding and diplomacy. Um, and so uh, we don't, you know, Americans don't practice that when they, when they travel as a tourist. They really should. Maybe that's part of the missing piece about why, you know, we have people coming over here thinking that, yeah, Hawaii is for them to just come and COVID vacation. No, you ask permission. Why are you here? Did you, did you get permission to come in? Uh, what are you going to do while you're here? Right? Did you bring gifts? You come to somebody's house, you didn't bring food or something? Like, what is that all about? Right? There's no respect. Uh, and so I think that cultivating a different way uh, that we look at others is important. And it has to be based yeah, on kind of respect and, and mutuality. Definitely. I really appreciate like your, your kind of geopolitical perspective on it as well and how there's so many issues that are connected to militarization, you know, in line with like foreign policy. If we look at like the Department of Defense, they are um, one of the biggest contributors to climate change. So that in itself and, you know, in relation to like their involvement in the Middle East and, um, for example, the Yemen crisis right now. So it's just, yeah, a lot of these are very interconnected. And um, I think a geopolitical narrative is really important when we talk about these things. Um, and so kind of going forward, um, just, just to be conscious of time, um, how do you, I guess, what do you, like, advice do you have in terms of moving forward, um, uh, like, in, in the face of COVID-19, in relation to, um, continuing to fight for demilitarization of Hawaii. Yeah, like, so wh how do you kind of see this, this kind of fight for um, welfare security and the demilitarization of Hawaii, how are they connected to you? So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> I'll just kind of talk about it maybe in terms of the immediate future and uh, how, you know, thinking mm -hmm. about the recovery uh, from COVID-19. So those, those alternative plans that I mentioned, I think they're a good uh, first start. Um, the, the rethinking the relationship to militarization uh, could be stronger in these plans. Um, and by investing in uh, these alternatives now, uh, I think we help build the capacity to actually pursue alternative futures. Right, there's a certain thing called path dependency where you put all your eggs in one basket and so you can't shift course because you're already kind of on a particular course. I feel like militarism and tourism are, are kind of created these path dependencies for Hawaii where we, we're afraid to veer off the path. The COVID has given us a gift in a way by disrupting that whole system you know, maybe now we, we look at it differently, right? And I think a lot of people have had these conversations. So what if uh, we, those, all those unemployed workers, we, we, we gave them a um, living allowance and we paid their tuition to go to university to learn new skills for the new economy we need. So it's based on restoring the environment. It's based on service to, you know, health, uh, education, and so forth. Um, you know, this is what happened when you have major dislocation of workers, like after World War II, and this is actually going back to something good that came out of um, the war and military. Uh, when, when the war ended, you have hundreds of thousands of GIs coming back, right, veterans from World War II, didn't have jobs, the economy could have been radically disrupted. So what did they do? They created the GI Bill, where people got paid uh, to go to school, and learn new skills, right? And so that infusion of knowledge, skill, and economics uh, helped to reset the economy in, in these um, dramatic ways, right? Um, I, th I think if we think of it in a similar way that we're, we're at a point of disruption and um, we, we have a, also a chance to change the course by investing in these alternatives. It will, it's gonna help uh, the public education, at least the university is, uh, going to have a new sort of purpose in terms of uh, thinking into the future, right? Uh, workers will have the means to live and to get re-educated. Uh, we'll be developing a capacity in our society for this new future that we want. 
uh, that, that takes climate change seriously, that takes uh, food security seriously, that looks at healthcare and education and housing as human rights, right, for everyone. Uh, I think that, you know, we, we have a chance to kind of like use this opportunity, right? Things have, there's a hula here, stuff has been wiped out, and so there's new terrain, new ground where things, different things could, could grow. Uh, and uh, so be the kipuka that will reseed that, that future that we want. No, thank you so much. I, I, I'm having this conversation like really brought a new perspective to mind for me and I'm pretty sure as well as all of our other youth here. Um, and I think we're so grateful to have you in this conversation. Uh, but do you have any like final words or um, advice to any youth activists out there who are, I guess, interested within your, within your field or who would like to see like a resilient future for the place they call home? Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase uh, a friend and, and a scholar, Kaleko Kaeo. He's a professor at Maui College and one of the Hawaiian leaders. Uh, and he's paraphrasing um, Michel Foucault, <laughs> the French theorist, right? So um, Kaleko says, um, we know what, we always know what one does, but we never know what one does, does. We don't, we, we can know what we do, right, the things that we do, but we don't know always what the effect will be in the long run. But if you do nothing, uh, there will be no possible um, alternative, right? So it's important that you do something, um, even if it doesn't bear immediate fruit, right? Again, it's about building the foundation, building those relationships, transforming the ground. So this is why mushrooms are really important. Because mushrooms, most of their life is mycelium, right? They're just underground, making connections, transforming minerals into stuff that plants can uptake, helping water move and all of that stuff. Uh, but if they didn't create the environment, that, that um, ecosystem underground uh, for other things to grow, there would be no possibility of a forest in its, in its full glory, right? So I'll be, you know, sometimes the work looks like mycelium. You're just toiling away on the ground, making connections happen, but you're transforming the entire ecosystem so that it is right. And there are the conditions necessary for something good to grow out of. So, you know, it's not always sexy. It's not always exciting, but do something and get involved. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out every day. We truly appreciate it. Sure. Um, with that being said, uh, I think that's all we have for today. Okay. So thank you awesome. so much, Kyle, for coming out, and we'll see you thank later. You. All right. Take care. Thank Thanks. you so much. Yeah. Aloha.